When you hear the phrase soft as steel, what do you think of? While the word steel might conjure up images such as massive high rise buildings, where does the soft part come in? And what exactly does this mean in our work and in our lives? Welcome to the Soft as Steel podcast with your host, Dennis Duran, featuring engaging conversations with a wide range of industry leaders around soft skills, how we practice love, inclusion, social justice, and compassionate leadership that's everlasting in the workplace. And now, here's Dennis Duran. My guest today is a longstanding friend and former colleague. I first met Mark Bridgers in 2002 when I joined him at FMI, a leading construction industry consulting and advisory firm. I would describe him simply as an active observer of all facets of the construction industry and more, as you will hear shortly in my introduction. Mark, a seasoned consultant in the construction industry, collaborates closely with contractors and suppliers. His expertise spans financial management, strategic planning, and organizational design. Mark clients have celebrated his transformative impact, with some even chronicling his work in published histories. His focus? Assisting contractors in assessing their current state, devising competitive strategies, and establishing effective corporate structures. Mark also crafts tools to monitor and measure success, guiding firms through strategic transitions. His passion lies in fostering breakthrough innovations through collaborative relationships. This is the connection to my focus, people and relationships. With over two decades of industry experience, Mark's knowledge extends to M&A, financial engineering, and risk management. His engaging speaking engagements have graced contractor associations, industry forums, and professional gatherings nationwide. And yes, he's been quoted in the Wall Street Journal. Mark Bridgers, a driving force in construction, bridging expertise and innovation. Mark, welcome to the Softest Steel podcast. Thank you, Dennis. And I hope to show the harder side of steel. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Okay. All right. Let's try a different question. So I made a note, as you may have observed when I read your introduction, where the phrasing talked about fostering breakthrough innovations through collaborative relationships, which I know is something that you have a lot of experience in. And this is my connection to people and relationships. Collaboration requires people to understand each other, be willing to work with each other, have goals they want to accomplish, those kinds of things. So this very much is, just tips right into my asking you this question. What are your thoughts about the relative importance of a person's qualities or what I call soft skills and their technical expertise? How do those two relate? What's more or less important or in your mind, does your experience tell you it's a toss up? No. So the, I find the soft skills are ultimately more important from a success standpoint. With that said, the technical skills are kind of like an ante in order to participate. You know, so said another way, You can't take somebody that doesn't understand math and engineering and have them design a building or a facility or infrastructure. They've got to have that basic characteristic. But again, that's the ante. You know, what really defines success is the soft skills, how they interact with others. You mentioned this idea of collaborative relationships. I'm a believer in this idea of win-win. And that win-win result, which goes beyond something that any individual party or corporation or entity could achieve on their own has to come through that collaboration. And that collaboration can only exist by using these more soft skills that individuals have to develop over time in the business world. Yeah, good. That's a terrific answer. So just off the top of your head, just let's stay with this little topic about soft skills. As you experience, work with, coach, collaborate with, consult to, et cetera, et cetera, leaders in a wide range of organizations, what are the first two or three qualities that you would say the ones that you separate as being incredible, powerful, persuasive leaders, what are the qualities or what I again call soft skills that you see in all of them? The one that I think is most important, but also is the hardest one is trust. And the reason for that is you have to put yourself out there in a group, in a business meeting, in a business relationship, And you have to build that trust between yourself and the other participants. If you can't figure out how to do that, then the business relationship ultimately might be workable, but will not meet the definition of success. And using that win-win concept that I described before, you simply can't get to a win-win result without that form of trust. That is the hardest thing for people to get their arms wrapped around and how to implement and how to 
cause that to occur in their business relationships. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. In fact, as, as you may recall, I know you're one of the handful of people that read my book cover to cover. Uh, and you may recall that the number one quality uh, in the survey that, that, uh, that I did in connection with that book uh, was trustworthiness. Um, so, so obviously you, you gave me the right answer. Uh, good job. Um, uh, but on a, on a serious note, I, I, again, I, I, I certainly agree. My research suggests that, uh, it's importance. What are the, what are the, uh, what are the aspects of human interaction, which, uh, hinder or make it more difficult to achieve trust in, among people in a relationship? And most importantly, a relationship between a leader, uh, and the peace, people that they lead. Yeah. So, so for me, the the leadership role is built around this idea of having a clearly articulated vision, using a mission to modify that vision and to describe what the milestones and the steps are in the process of che- achieving that vision, and then ultimately designing a strategy. And so the, the areas where I see the greatest opportunity for improvement are where, in many instances, individuals have skipped one of those three critical steps. In some instances, they might have articulated a well-designed strategy, but there's no context to it because there's a there's no mission or vision. In other instances, they might have a vision, but they haven't brought structure and organization and detail to it by defining a mission or strategy. And so figuring out how to apply all three of those characteristics effectively is where I think the greatest opportunity is. Okay. I'm going to try to, to bait you into an answer for the, the next question. At the most basic level uh, in everything that you've been involved in, uh, being a member of teams, facilitating teams, consulting to individuals and to groups, uh, what is the most fundamental uh, skill or ability that individuals need to, to value in order to be able to be successful? <laughs> well, I... I'm not sure exactly how to answer that question. You know, uh, I'm a practitioner that uses the DISC profile. Mm -hmm. Uh, That might be a tool that you're familiar with. And there are four characteristics uh, within the DISC profile. There's the D, which is the dominant characteristic. There's the I, which is the influencing characteristic. There's the S, which is a steadiness characteristic. And the C, which is a control or criticalness characteristic. If you look at the best performing groups and teams and organizations, they somehow have figured out how to balance the other three characteristics, which are the D, the I, and the C, with individuals that exhibit the S or the steadiness characteristic. And so that steadiness is critical to success over time. And also the S uh, characteristic is one of the ones that frequently have the hardest time building trust because they want to see rules and organization and structure, and that helps them to understand that the organization is moving in the right direction or the team is moving in the right direction. And so, you know, to get back to kind of the core of the question, you know, that soft skill, you know, that I think maybe makes the best fit is somebody that recognizes that we have to have that steadiness, those individuals that um, bring that steadiness characteristic and search for a way to integrate those individuals into the teams. Mm-hmm. Where do you think communication fits into everything we're, we've talked about so far? Well, frankly, you can't recruit the S's without effective communication. And so it's critical to causing that to occur. And so, you know, this idea of going back to the vision and the mission and the strategy, the fourth step to that is to develop a communication plan that holds all three of those pieces together and helps people to wrap their heads around it and to get galvanized around those characteristics. And without that communication, you can't accomplish it. Even if you have the best described vision, the most detailed mission, the most effective strategies, if you cannot effectively communicate them, you can't get to the finish line. So I'm going to grab, I'm going to grab effective communication out of that, all those phrases uh, and and offer the thought that uh, from from my vantage point, um, communication is something which either facilitates uh, relationship building and cooperation, uh, it, but if not done if not done well, um, uh, it can also be a uh, an, an impediment to being able to be able to create and build relationships and ultimately get to that pinnacle you talked about, which is achieving trust. That makes yep. sense. That I, makes I sense. agree with you. And, 
Yeah, communication is the classic double-edged sword. You know, if you do it well, it can be successful. If you do it poorly, it can be a disaster. Yeah, yeah. I want to stay with this trust thing. Can can you talk to our audience about a little bit more about uh, about any situations uh, anecdotally that you could talk about where it became very clear early on in your work with a team or a group of individuals uh, that there was a serious issue associated with the, the trust that existed between leadership or leaders and the people that they led their team members. Yeah. And so, you know, this kind of ties back into how do you approach the concept of trust, you know, but um, I, sometimes I'll use the phrase uh, trust in God and in all things and everything else verified. Mm. And so in that context, trust is part of the process, but blind trust is not an effective way to have a, have commu- um, high performing business relationships. And so how do you bring trust, but also verify? And I'll give a classic example. There was uh, one of my clients, which was a builder of large, expensive uh, infrastructure. And they had a business relationship with a contractor that was responsible for doing most of their capital construction. And this business relationship had been forged by a small group of senior managers at both organizations that did all of the things we've been talking about, Dennis. They articulated a vision. They worked on a mission. They developed detailed strategies. They designed effective communication plans. And over time, they built deep trust. And that trust was verified by using performance management and performance metrics to establish, are we doing the things that we said we were going to do? Now, as this business relationship progressed, some of the individuals retired. Some of them got promoted. Some of them got promoted into the business relationship. And over time, they began to drop the verify part of trust, and they simply were trusting blindly. And in this particular case, there was a program of construction that had a defined timeline that it was supposed to be completed by, and the contractor was given this program of work. Our our, our timeline was laid out for them, and the expectations were articulated. There was, however, very little monitoring from that point forward that the contractor was doing the set of things that the contractor needed to do in order to meet those standards. The expectation was we have a high quality relationship. We'll simply trust that they're going to accomplish the work. Well, lo and behold, in this particular case, the manager at the contractor who had been relatively recently promoted into this position, cherry picked the easiest and the most profitable work to perform first and then left the hardest and the more problematic work to be completed at the end of that timeline. And as they got close to the end, it became mathematically impossible to meet those regulatory requirements. And that's an example of my mind where that one instance eroded a decade of trust. Mm -hmm. And that trust, frankly, has never really returned to that business relationship. And so that's one of these examples of how you can kill trust very easily, but it takes forever to build it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great uh, that's a great story. Uh, it has uh, hints of the things that I have some exposure to in my past. I want to kind of shift gears a little bit and uh, and bring you more squarely into getting your thoughts, uh, your th- your th- your thoughts and your feelings about uh, the things that I talk about quite a bit as it relates to the people part of of our business. Um, I have a view that is, that is held by a fairly significant number of people uh, that just at, just on the top top layer, that our industry does not value soft skills, does not value uh, understanding the qualities, attributes, uh, the characteristics, the, the, the personal values of individuals. Um, and that, that that is a, a problem which is continuing uh, and is contributing to a whole range of issues, uh, including uh, the challenges of trying to attract individuals into the industry uh, at all levels, entry level as well as middle level and technical positions, um, uh, dealing with issues uh, related to differences uh, between people and that reference to diversity. Uh, dealing specifically with issues associated with women in the industry, uh, which is a, hard, a hot topic. of. Con- if I had to say there's two hot topics in our industry right now, I would say that it's, it's women in the industry and artificial intelligence. To me, at least that's kind of my – let's, let's, I'm interested. I read that point. To, to, what do you think about, about my offering saying those are two of the hottest topics in the industry right now? 
Uh, well, I agree with you. And if you expand the definition of women to include a diverse workplace, you know, which would go simply beyond women, I think they are the two hottest topics. You know, from our standpoint, as an example, we have uh, our, in our consulting work, we have always been built around this idea of innovation. And so how are you driving innovation? And we're looking at AI or artificial intelligence as simply the next source of innovation. And mm -hmm. so we, we keep a inventory or a library, um, innovative construction techniques and processes and approaches. And we've just recently hired two staff who their goal is to look at artificial intelligence and figure out how it can be applied to the construction space. But we're, we're looking at it in a very, in, a, in what I think is a unique way. So most of the artificial intelligence discussion has been around what I'll call thinking tasks, which is how do you streamline something that, you know, is a, a thinking activity. So I'll give you a simplistic example. How do you build an estimate faster, you know, by using artificial intelligence to perform a takeoff for you? You know, so mm -hmm. in a manual sense, you know, it might take longer for an individual to perform a takeoff than it than artificial intelligence might be able to do it. But what we're looking at is how does artificial intelligence impact the field? and mm -hmm. the performance of work in the field. And there's three areas that we're particularly focused on. One is how can artificial intelligence be used to augment the workforce availability challenge that exists across all construction activities? So in the simplistic way to think about this is the current available workforce can perform a certain amount of work activity. And in many industries, some portion of the budgeted spend does not take place in the year anticipated simply because there aren't enough field crews or aren't enough contractors to perform that work. And so how can artificial intelligence be applied to take work that under normal circumstances might be pushed into the future and bring it into the current? Said another way, how do we use artificial intelligence to improve field productivity and cause the same size workforce? to achieve more work. The second way we're looking at it is how can you expand the workforce by using artificial intelligence paired with machine learning and robotics? And let me give you a simplistic example that ties into women. Uh, there are many construction trades where you have to be able to lift a hundred pounds in order to perform that work activity. That's particularly true on underground and heavy civil type construction trades uh, and some industrial construction trades. And there are many men, or there are some men and many women who simply cannot lift 100 pounds. And so in that context, how could you potentially take a 105-pound woman, have her paired with robotics that is enhanced through machine learning and artificial intelligence, and make it possible for a 105-pound woman to effectively lift 100 pounds safely? And so that's an augmentation of the workforce. The way we're thinking about that is, how do you expand the pool of people that can perform any particular function? And then the third way we're thinking about it is, how do you take somebody who is of average skill and experience and use artificial intelligence to cause them to perform at a superior level? And I'll give you a very simplistic example. The best performing foreman and superintendents understand that they have got to plan their work for the next day and the next week in advance. They can't simply react to the things that they're observing when they get to the job site on that day or during that week. And this is something uh, that they learn over time via on-the-job training of how to perform this function. And if you were to ask many of them, how do you perform your job so efficiently, so effectively, so safely, so profitably, what you would find is they say something to the effect of, I simply do the job. Mm -hmm. But if you pour down on how they are do it, it is they plan for the next day. They take into account challenges. They work on items the day before they're supposed to be dealt with. They deal with long lead time material items beforehand. And all of that is what ties back into this efficiency. Well, how can you use artificial intelligence to prepare a checklist for an average skilled, average experienced foreman or superintendent to apply those same concepts. Those concepts are not magic. The person simply doesn't know how to apply them or to apply them in order to raise their performance. And so that third area is how do we take average skill, average experienced people and use artificial intelligence or machine learning to raise their performance to a superior level? 
again, that ties back into improving the output and the efficiency and the safety as well. And so those are, you know, back to kind of where we started the conversation. These are the most important things and frankly are going to be the most transformative things as you look forward into the construction space. Yes. Uh, in fact, as you expanded and mentioned machine learning and robotics, uh, again, I, I might I might revise at least part of my thought to say that technologies uh, are, the, are the hot topic. AI is probably, again, I think, in many ways leading it because of a lot of the things that you've described in terms of how it can affect things, affect tasks, affect people's ability to evaluate situations, to be able to make decisions and take actions. So it's, it gets it. It's also it's a high level tool, but it's also a very fundamental mechanical aid uh, when you talk about work processes, so I think it's terrific. It's interesting uh, that the uh, by by the random selection of this uh, of this host, we started out talking and spent some time talking about trust, and now we've 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 moved over, moved away from talking about trust and leaders, and now we're talking about issues in the industry. Um, uh, I want to I want to connect those two. Uh, because I think one of the challenges that we continue to face, in addition to things I've already said, uh, is that as we try to innovate, and some some contractors, some engineering firms, uh, some players in the industry are, are doing some impressive things already, um, uh, and there are also technology vendors. Uh, one one is a large and and uh, and uh, is impactful in many ways uh, in the whole management processes uh, is Procor, uh, and. Uh, uh, and again, they're 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 a very a visible entity in the industry, uh, and they bring the technology to help solve problems, uh, including how to do basic work tasks that are involved in planning, building, uh, and turning over a project to to its owner. Um, so, so the trust part uh, is, you know, again, just keeps coming back because we we've got a muddle uh, of situations right now that involve the people part. Uh, I think you did a, a, a terrific job of, of talking about that and, and, and appropriately broadening, uh, because in, in a sense it is, a, it is broader than that. Um, the, the women with diverse backgrounds, uh, if, you, if you include the diverse backgrounds piece, you're making a big dent in the, in the statistical demographics of, of ethnic and racial uh, groups represented in the construction industry, uh, not doing anything to the, to the benefit necessarily of any of them, but helping to understand them. Uh, and and we, 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 I'm sure you understand as well that, uh, you know, as an example in the construction industry, you know, over 30 percent of the construction industry workforce are sp Hispanic. Um, yet we're we're still in, and now with the dawn of, of of rapidly penetrating, rapidly expanding use of AI, uh, the whole notion of the communication issues associated with with a non with an English speaking person trying to supervise a Spanish speaking workforce, those things are are, are going to dissipate and, and and should be non issues as it relates to the 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 skill or the ability where they'll remain an issue, and I'd like your comment on this, where they'll remain an issue, again, gets into thinking about when we talk about inclusion uh, as, as, the, as, the, as a step, as a, as a looking forward step, starting with diversity, differences, uh, and the answer to the question I ask audience all the time, what's one thing we all have in common with each other? And the answer is that we're different from each other. Uh, but that's, that, is, that is a hurdle that we are struggling to get over. Um, the equity piece, I call it social justice because I brought, brought it to include all of the issues uh, that we're dealing with as far as wellness, uh, suicide, addiction, mental health, all those things, along with these demographic differences, along with the generational differences, which again, it's just, there, there are so many different ways to look at what's going on with the people challenges and how things like AI technologies in a broader sense are, can, can impact that but not at the level of building relationships per se or, or, or garnering trust in individuals. That's separate and apart from those. That's really, show me what you're doing. Uh, and if, if what you're doing is what you said you were going to do, you have integrity, that's a building block towards de developing trust. Your thoughts? Yeah, uh, you know, Dennis, I, I agree entirely. And so you know, for me, the flip side of trust is fear. Mm. And so when I look at business relationships, and this is just kind of a rule of thumb, but if you have experience in industries outside of construction, our rule of thumb is that the construction industry is 10 years behind in the adoption of technology and process and improvement techniques 
versus other industries. And the reason for that, in my view, is fear. Fear that we might be taken advantage of, fear that the technology won't work, fear that the technology might displace critical people, fear that the technology might change the way the job gets done. And the construction industry is one of the most hazardous industries if you simply look at financial performance of projects. And by hazardous, I mean the most volatile, meaning that any particular job could be a great home run, could be an average, or could be a terrible disaster. And that variability, every single contractor is subject to that variability. And that breeds fear, which breeds difficulty in trusting. And it's tied back into this idea that you don't see these types of innovations applied in the construction industry because of that. There's also a concept that I like to refer to as industry inertia. And it's the there's the old joke uh, that you might have heard before, Dennis, about the young woman that is recently married and is hosting the first Thanksgiving and she uh, buys a ham and then cuts the end off the ham and puts it into the pan and cooks the ham plus the end together. And her mother uh, comes and somebody asks her a question and she says, well, mom, why did you always cut the end of the ham off? And the mother says, well, I don't really know. Grandma always did it that way. And then the grandma's there and the daughter asked the grandmother, Grandma, why did you always cut the end off the ham? Does that make it taste better? And grandma goes, well, no, I didn't have a pan that was large enough to cook a whole (laughs) ham. And so this is the industry inertia where people simply do the things that they have always done without knowledge as to why and without investigating whether or not there might simply be a different or better way to do it. That prevents the incorporation of diverse businesses into the industry. It prevents the incorporation of diverse people onto the trades. It prevents the building of effective collaborative relationships between contractors and owners and operators. And all of this ties back into fear that I might make a mistake, that I might make a loss on this project. Mm -hmm. And so we somehow, in, in in our work, we are trying to squeeze out the fear from the business relationship. And if you can effectively squeeze that fear out, you can create an opportunity to build that trust that we talked about before. And so the ways that we do that, we look at building joint teams. We look at building diverse teams. We look at causing the owner, the engineer, and the contractor to work together to solve common problems. And these are the types of things that can drive fear out of the business relationship. And that's what can ultimately yield tremendous success potentially out of the construction space. And so our mission is built around this idea of transforming the industry. And that transformation in our mind is a transformation of the mindset of our clients to drive fear out, to build trust and structure and use that trust and structure to achieve those win-win solutions. Yeah. And then I'll circle back and say that wouldn't you say, uh, because you've been implying in a variety of ways, that again, this this kind of points back to that, uh, the answer to the question I was looking for, which you did not give me when I asked the question originally. So we're going to ask the question again. uh, And this is your chance. Uh, The listeners understand that Mark and I have known each other since 2002. Um, but, but what, what I want to hear you to share your thoughts about is, uh, again, you talk about fear and I agree with that, uh, that being really the opposite extreme of trust. I think it's, I think it's a terrific treatment of those two concepts and they're valuable concepts. But, um, I talk a lot about, um, uh, well, I, I talk a lot about these days about, uh, about not simply understanding, uh, other people. But the challenge that we have, and this will probably take the rest of our time to explore this a bit, um, you brought up the DISC behavioral assessment early on. Um, I, I utilize that instrument uh, significant, in a significant way as part of how I work with groups. And the fundamental reason that I, that I offer that and suggest that uh, is that if you want to be successful in building relationships, relationships with other people, you need to understand yourself. Uh, and a behavioral style instrument like the DISC profile, any one of the one, many of the versions that are out there, it doesn't really matter. Um, they provide you what I view is, is is a factual representation of who you are in the environment you operate on a day to day basis, how people see you. Um, and so them seeing you is important. Uh, but then you need to understand yourself so that you're better prepared to, tr- to be able to understand other people. And that takes us into a conversation about the importance of communication. 
uh, about the about its value in in learning about one another uh, and how uh, com uh, how communication the, the 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 use of words uh, and the use of of uh, of nonverbal uh, uh, clues about what's what's really going on in your in your brain, all that stuff is valuable skill that needs to be understood and 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 employed by people to help them. And then that takes us to the kind of the capstone thought, and that is you know there's a lot of conversation. I'm sure you read a lot of articles, as do I, with regards to emotional intelligence. Uh, again, that's something I sp I've spent a lot of time learning about, talking to people about, uh, and it just, again, what it does is just, it just points out, you know, the fundamental importance of understanding oneself, because that's the, that's the foundation of emotional intelligence, uh, and a good friend of probably both of us, um, whose name I can't remember right now, uh, Brent Darnell, uh, Brent Darnell has done work in this area for the past 20 years. Um, and so I want to go back and just get you to make sure that we're on the same uh, page with, with regards to the fundamental necessity of having good communication skills uh, as a way to help people understand who you are, but also to help you understand who other people are. Your thoughts? I agree with you, Dennis. You know, that this idea of trying to understand others and what motivates and drives and causes them to to see upside and, and to not be fearful is critical. But the first step of that is to understand yourself. You know, mm -hmm. so as an example, my disc profile is a high D and a high C, which is euphemistically referred to as a son of a bitch profile. Mm -hmm. And that profile is one where for me, one of the biggest challenges that I have is to tamp down the natural characteristics that are associated with that profile and be more reflective to be more um, effective and to be more interactive in ways that fit better with individuals that have different profiles. And mm -hmm. so finding a way to, to manage my own behavior is the critical path to making our business successful and making our customers successful. And that same characteristic applies to all of the more collaborative business relationship activities that we're working on with clients, yeah. where if they can't understand themselves, they sure as hell can't understand each other. And so that's one of the key things that we're trying to, to cause them to do. And I'll just give you a recent example. Um, we've been working with a client that happens to be here in North Carolina, and they're working on a large uh, water-related project. And this particular project is in an area where there's been severe flooding, and they're trying to manage the water in this particular area to push back on the flooding and to better manage it and not simply to push the problem farther downstream. Now, uh, as we were working with the project team, we began to get some inklings that there actually might be another driver for this particular project. And it turns out that this particular job got some federal funding that came out of the COVID era uh, infrastructure bills. And this funding requires mitigation of nitrogen infused into the water and secondly, has very specific timelines over which the money has to be allocated and money has to be spent. Yet in all of the preparation we did, neither of these topics came up when we were talking with the participants about what the purpose of the project is. So when we held the project meeting, we brought this topic out. And it was at that point, everybody, you could see the light bulbs going on in their heads. They now understood the other parties and why they were behaving in that fashion. Mm -hmm. That doesn't get exactly to what you were you were pointing at, but it's pointed in the same direction, which is if you can't understand the underlying things that are driving actions and decisions, you can't understand what's going on around you. And mm -hmm. so that was one of the critical things that we worked on in this instance to where the project team could build that understanding around what they were really solving for. Yeah, that's a great story. And you're right. And it does touch on the whole notion that as people enter into relationships, they make sometimes they make simplistic assumptions. They say, "Well, we're going to be doing business with Joe Smith for the next six years, so looks good. Looks good. He's a good guy. Everybody says he's a good guy. You've never met the guy, and then Joe Smith shows up, and there's something about Joe Smith that just doesn't sit right with you. But rather than try to understand that it may be, he may have a tick. You know, he may have an expression on his face. He may have a way of using certain language. If you don't listen carefully, don't observe carefully, you will fly into the river known as bias." 
And that's not a river you want to flow in. There's a lot of talk about implicit and unconscious bias, particularly as it relates to race and other kinds of disadvantaged class issues, which need to be dealt with or we're struggling to deal with. But it's at that fundamental level. If we're going to work together, we first have a base as a connection. We then have to work to try to get a basic understanding of one another. And it doesn't happen in the course of a one-hour meeting. Uh, it takes time. And we need to make sure that we mutually understand what our mission is, what our purpose is, and what our respective roles are in it so that we can hold each other accountable in a constructive and relationship-oriented way and then head down the road and produce a good result. So, Yeah, that's a great description, Dennis. And let me just tell a quick story. This that, will be the uh, last Mike, story of the day. You've got the last story. <laughs> so early in my career, we were working on a business relationship between an owner and a contractor. And in this particular case, this contractor had five senior vice presidents around the country. And so we were working with one of those senior vice presidents. And this customer was one of the most important customers, if not the most important customer for this, this contractor. And there was some concern about the behaviors of the individual who was a senior vice president at the contracting organization and whether or not those behaviors fit in this more collaborative business relationship dynamic that they were trying to build. And this particular senior vice president happened to be the most profitable performing region for the company. And as they were looking at this, as they began to build the business relationship, it became clear that this individual did not have the trust of the rest of the team and who was participating in some behaviors that were destroying that trust. And the team got together and came back as a group and said, you know what, this individual does not fit the characteristics that we are trying to build as a group. If we actually believe that we're trying to accomplish these things, this individual needs to be in a different region or a different geography or in a different business relationship than this one. And so in that instance, in more, most traditional construction relationships, the contractor would simply tell the customer to pound sand, mm -hmm. you know, because this is the most profitable person in their business. In this particular case, they moved that individual over to another region and put another senior vice president in that relationship. That's one of the critical things that built this trust and alleviated that fear from the business relationship that we talked about earlier. That ties back into a diversity topics. It ties back into looking at the AI and how to apply that. And ultimately, it ties back into this idea of building win-win results out of these types of relationships. Yeah. And so the, the lesson I'd like to leave you and the listeners with, Dennis, is that it is not possible to get to this finish line if you measure the finish line as a win-win result, which cannot be achieved by either party by themselves without trust, without communication, without understanding yourself. And those are the key things that will make it possible to get to that finish line. I can't think of a better way to end this conversation, which probably could have gone on for hours. They would have run out of tape if it was being taped. But I think thoughts are a great capstone to our conversation, Mark, because this has been way too much fun, but actually a pretty interesting conversation. But we'll leave it up to our listeners to decide. Thanks so much for coming on the Softest Steel podcast. My pleasure, Dennis. And again, thank you for showing the softer side of steel as one of the most critical aspects. <laughs> Very good. Thanks, Mark. Take care. Thanks for joining us today for this episode of the Softest Steel podcast with your host, Dennis Duran. Dennis is the author of Softest Steel and a leading speaker and trainer for organizations across many industries and verticals. To learn more about the work Dennis is doing to activate soft skills in the workplace, contact him at DennisDuranSpeaking.com. Be sure to check out his book, Softest Steel, on Amazon or wherever books are sold. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or wherever you'd like to get your podcasts. And please remember to share this episode with your friends, colleagues, and anyone you feel would benefit from the conversation. We'll see you next time on the Softest Steel Podcast with Dennis Duran. Produced by Audavita Studios. Connect your voice to the world.